what we're talking about, we're talking about chapter 12, and we're talking about the pre-organization and pre-operating expenses for a bank. Uh, to, to start the bank, you have to apply with the government, and this is called the application for a de novo bank, or a bank which is new. And uh, you have to tell the government uh, why you want the bank in this particular location, what is the assessment area you're going to be serving, or the area that you will serve, and where is the competition from other banks, and where would your bank fit, and, and why. And then you have to tell the regulators something about the potential for business, like how many loans you're going to get in the first six months, in the first year, income and expense statement, assets and liabilities, a whole thing. And the government would not talk to you or even accept an application before you hire a president for that bank and a chief financial officer for that bank and a chief credit officer for that bank. Now, imagine uh, who's going to accept this position with a new bank unless this bank is heavily capitalized. The, in the good old days, uh, about 15 years ago, required about three to five million dollars of capital to start a bank. It cost about 150 to 200 thousand dollars to uh, go through the pre-organizational expenses. Today, it requires minimum of 15 million dollars capital to start a bank and at least a million and a half to two million dollars of pre-organizational expenses to start a bank. And that's, of course, a very prohibitive cost. <clears throat> In our case, when we started, we had a lot of deficiencies. Uh, we were a very small group. Uh, we decided to rely on ourselves, not to go out hat in hand, uh, uh, getting the people in oil producing countries uh, to chip money in. And it was a very difficult road. But I just wanted to share with you the strategy that you sit down and you, 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 you think about it, see how you can develop from a small beginning to a bigger beginning and hopefully to a much bigger future. So we did not have the capital and also the regulators didn't know much about us. Uh, we're a bunch of people uh, that actually uh, are not known to the regulators or in the banking industry and uh, we wanted to get in the banking industry. So um, one thing uh, that we also wanted to do was at the time, we called it Islamic banking, which also was foreign. Nobody knew what you're talking about. You must be crazy. Uh, so how to take action, how to proceed. So I call this uh, starting from the possible to achieve the impossible. So after a long uh, process of thinking and analyzing, we said, okay, let us start a company uh, within our capabilities and that is American Finance House Lariba. We started that back in 1987 as a finance company that is licensed by the State of California Department of Corporations. Now, as you remember in our discussion in Chapter 5, the finance company cannot take deposits across the bench. The only institutions that can take deposits are depository institutions which are chartered banks by the United States authorities. We said, okay, we'll start a finance company and then the next question was in what format we should start the company. Uh, when you study uh, business law, uh, there are many types of companies. There is a C, C like a cat, C corp, a C corp is a regular corporation. And regular corporations are actually uh, owned by either individuals or shareholders. And I don't want to get into business law, but C Corp is taxed twice. How? When you make a profit in a C Corp or in a corporation, suppose you made a profit of $100,000, the government will charge you 42% tax on it. That is federal tax of 42% then you lose 42%. And then that what is left in the corporation is distributed to the shareholders as a dividend, and then you get it in your income 
and because of that, you also pay taxes on it. We call that the syndrome of double taxation. The corporation pays taxes, and then you, as a shareholder, pay taxes. Now, luckily, we met someone who actually educated us about a new type of companies that is on the uh, books of the United States called a sub-chapter S corporation. The word S, like Sam, starts for small corporation. And a small corporation at the time we started, I think had a limit of 35 shareholders. Now I think the limit has increased to about 120 shareholders. Now, the small corporation has a number of requirements on it. The first requirement is that the shareholders should be known to each other. That, and the second thing is it should be a small corporation and it has some limitations on the capital. And the advantage of a small corporation is that it does not suffer from the double taxation syndrome. So all the profits that come to the bottom line are distributed directly to the shareholders and they pay taxes on their own taxation level depending on their income. We actually uh, then went to the second step. Now, of course, to do this, we had to rely on inexpensive lawyers, uh, people that we can afford, and uh, we, we registered the company. Now, the next step was to get money, and, and getting the money was another challenge uh, because uh, I'm not independently wealthy, uh, but I have a lot of friends and associates. The first thing is I went to the rich and affluent uh, of my friends, people who really made it big, and they said, get out of here. We don't want to mess around with this community project because people will think that we're taking advantage of them. I kept saying we're not taking advantage of people who are trying to serve people uh, and, and offer a service to their children and grandchildren, but it didn't work out. So we got together with a number of our very, very close friends who are actually middle class, upper middle class. And I told them, you know, let's chip in a minimum of $10,000 each. Uh, some chipped in 20, some chipped in more. Uh, and I said, if we ever lose this money, uh, please do not hate me for the rest of your life. So this is uh, considered to be uh, risk money. And that risk money, uh, you know, consider it as a contribution for a better future of your kids and uh, grandkids. Uh, we raised $200,000, and that was the first capital for American Finance House, Nariba. The next step was we had now $200,000 in Wells Fargo account, and the question is what to do with it. Now, so so the, the problem shifted from getting money to how to invest the money. And, and I, I share this story with you because if you have the good intentions, the good Lord will never forget you. So I, this is a true story, and I'm not, I'm not giving you a story. This is the truth. I was sitting in my office at, at the time to was Shir Salim, and now it's Smith Barney City Group. And I get a phone call from a very dear friend, God bless his soul, he died, uh, who was a, one of the distinguished nuclear scientists of the United States, and he comes from the same university in Egypt that I came from. And uh, he calls me and he says, Yahya, my uh, furniture has moved from San Diego to Madison, Wisconsin, where I went to school, and I cannot unload it because I sold my house to one from the community, one person in the community, and he didn't pay me. Do you have $80,000 so I can take care of it. I said, well, are you buying a new house? He said, yeah. Uh, I said, how much is it? He said, $200,000. He said, well, I'll send you $200,000. He said, yeah, yeah, I don't want any more joking because I am sick and tired and I, I, I have enough. I said, no, really, I will send you $200,000. And that was the very first house ever financed by American Finance House happened to be in the city of Madison, Wisconsin, where I went to school, the first city I landed in the United States, and that was in 1987. Now, that became history. 
and we started financing cars and homes and small businesses. Of course, uh, dealing with $200,000 and a few dollars here and there uh, cannot cut all the demand that started coming in. Another interesting story that I wanted to, to share with you, and, and I'm sharing it with you because please, please, anything that comes across you, don't ever discount it. Consider it as a gift from God, from the good Lord to you, and, and try to take advantage of it and learn from it. One day, I was walking into the offices of American Finance House. Of course, I was uh, working at uh, Cheers Lehman or Citigroup, earning a living. I was volunteering my time at American Finance House, Lariba. So I used to come during lunchtime. I used to come early in the morning. I used to come in the evening so I can get the thing going and then go back to my work so I can earn a living. I was walking in and then coming out of the door, a very sad young man, very upset. So I said, uh, I introduced myself and I said, what are you upset about? He said, you know, I came here to finance a computer for $3,500 and he rejected me. So I said, come, let's talk. Uh, his name is Mustafa, and Mustafa is the son uh, of the Imam at Masjid Omar ibn Khattab. And, uh, and uh, I said, uh, what do you need? He said, I need to uh, finance a computer. I said, why do you buy a $3,500 computer? He said, I'm doing my master's degree at USC. And uh, I'm doing it in uh, developing websites. I said, what is a website? I didn't know what a website is. In 1987, very few people knew what a website is. So he explained to me what a website is, and he showed me something. He really captured my imagination. And here's something that I want to also share with you, because you're all young. You have a wonderful future ahead of you. Do not discount new ideas. Just absorb them. Uh, look in the future, because if you have a plan for the future, it will fit in and you will develop it. Now, believe it or not, I said, uh, Mustafa, guess what? I'm going to guarantee your uh, loan personally. Go ahead and buy the computer, but I want a favor for you. He said what? I said, can you do a website for American Finance House? He said, yeah, by all means. And in 1988, we started the first ever website, to my knowledge, of a finance company or a bank uh, and that's why our website is a very, very strong, has a strong presence in the industry. And actually, as you know, in Pasadena and as you know in Whittier, is a major source of all of our incoming inquiries uh, for financing homes and cars and so on and so forth. That is uh, the story uh, as, as it happened. And, um, and if you have any questions, I'll stop here and I'll answer it. Yes, doctor. If you have initially $200,000 capital and you buy the first house, then how do you continue doing business? Where do you get the rent? Oh. Well, uh, what happened was uh, Dr. Hilal, rahimahullah, went through a bank and he got refinanced after four months or six months. So we got the money back. And then uh, we had, uh, uh, of course, as you said, you don't have much money. so. Financing a home of $200,000 requires, uh, you do this five times, that's a million dollars, and we didn't have the money. So we put in restrictions. Do you know that the first loan to value that we put in at American Finance House was 70 to 8%? In other words, uh, I mean 30%. Now, if you want to buy a home for $100,000, you have to have $70,000. So the loan to value was 30%. And when I researched the beginning of the mortgage industry in America, guess what? When the mortgage industry in America started, the loan to value was 30% and the highest was 40%. And it slowly went to what we have today, 80, 90, 95% loan to value. But that meant that we only can finance a home once every four months. We can finance a car once every month. We can finance a small business equipment and stuff like that once every three or four months. That is the $200,000. But then we went to our friends uh, who are well-to-do and we said, 
why don't you invest in Lariba in the form of a debenture, a debenture which is like an IOU. And we wrote in promissory notes, personal promissory notes, guarantees by yours truly, Yahya Abdurrahman, that we are going to um, guarantee your payment in case anything happens to the company and you will return a very nice return. And they had to be the only requirement in the United States if you do this is that the person who does that invest with you should be what we call a sophisticated investor, an accredited investor, a person who knows the risk of investing. And that was the beginning of what you have on your ledger, Maria, is what we call a special investor. Right, Maria? Yes. Yes, sir. Right. That, is, that was the beginning of it. And, and that's how it started. But then, of course, as you said, you can't do much with 500,000 capital or 600,000 money. Uh, so we went to, to ask people to deposit money with us. They always told us we want to have FDIC insurance on our deposits. And that actually prompted us in 1991 to start looking for a bank. And uh, that was the beginning of our trip into uh, banking. Now, why did we want to have a bank? Because, uh, first of all, it's FDIC insured, so everybody would deposit money with us. And, of course, it adds the credibility of the American banking system to what we are doing. And we want to, to create a pool of uh, wonderful men and women like you. I mean, without you and each and every one of you, we wouldn't have had this happen at all. And, and God willing, we're going to expand it and make it bigger and more effective in, in the United States and, uh, and, uh, and beyond. So uh, I, I have here a number of slides on the benefits of offering a banking alternative in the United States, what I call RF banking. And it is in the book, and I will ask you to please read it carefully. And, uh, and the last uh, this slide, for instance, says that we wanted to create healthy competition between the RIBA-based conventional banks and banking products and the RF uh, banking products and services. And in my humble opinion, we're not out to destroy the RIBA-based banks or the conventional banks. First of all, we're, we're too small. We're just a little ant compared to them. We are out there to offer an alternative to our customers. And we hope that if we are really serious about what we say, we're going to offer products and services that are better than the ones that are offered by the RIBA-based banks. And if this is the case, I promise you, the RIBA-based banks will emulate us as we have seen in a number of major banks. Uh, the question is, uh, well, you, you keep telling us about RIBA-based banks and uh, riba free banks what's what's the difference well the difference really is in the way you handle the customer the way you handle a loan if you go to any regular conventional bank and apply for a car loan you will sit down you fill in an application and the loan officer will sit down and tell you well we're going to rent you money, you will not say rent, but we're going to give you a loan uh, of $30,000 and the rent on it is going to be 6% and the monthly payment will be such and such. But you will not stop there because uh, the, the banker in the riba based bank is trained to increase the size of his loan portfolio. His, his mission is to get you to borrow more. I don't know if you've had the experience or not, but if you go and buy a car, uh, the car salesman wants to sell you not only the car, but a lot of options in the car, or a bigger car. Have you had the pleasure? Do you agree? Yes, we do. Right? Uh, have you had the pleasure in with here uh, buying an, uh, an Audi? Who's buying an Audi these days? Mohammed bought an Audi. Alex will be buying one soon, right, Alex? <laughs> no. No? All right. So, so anyway, 
not only that will sell you uh, a, a, an Audi 4 or an Audi 5, they won't sell you a bigger car, they won't sell you a more expensive car because the, the more the money involved, the more commission you will get. So, and and, uh, and you tell them, well, uh, how many years should I pay back? They will say, well, hmm, you have very good credit. You can take seven years. Why? Because the riba based banker is trained to try to find out somebody who is successful to associate himself with it and try to squeeze money out of him or her for as long a time as possible. And I want to let you in on a very important secret. And when you go back to your offices, uh, Daniel and, and Alex and Anwar and so on, look at the amortization schedule and Wajia and, and Bill, all of you, look at the amortization schedule of a 30-year home financing. You will find that it takes seven years of monthly payments to start making a dent, a small dent in the principal. Do you understand what I'm saying? That the monthly payments will be 99% or more interest and a very small portion in principal. And it starts making a dent in seven years. That's why most of the river-based bankers enjoyed it. First of all, America used to be a very mobile country. The average staying time of a family in America was three to five years in the same home for two reasons. Number one, of course, the family grew. You have kids and the kids grew, so they wanted to go into a bigger home. And the second reason was the job market was very mobile. If you stayed in one place for three years or four years in the past, then it's too long. You got to go to another company so you can get promotions, then you can get bigger and so on and so forth. So what happened? What happened is that every five to six years, you start the process over again. So you pay off and you start over again. So you live in debt for the rest of your life. And that is the whole idea of a riba-based banker. So it is very simple. He's got his computer program. You plug in the amount of money to be financed, how many years, how much is the rent, 5%, 6%, and that loan is the monthly payment. Now, if you go to a, a RIBA free banker, that is not what you are trained to do, and I hope this is what you are trained to do. First of all, we want to get to know the family. We want to know who is this family. Uh, some customers complain that we want a copy of the resumes and we want to know the resume of the family because we want to know the background, we want to know how many kids they have, we want to know their income. Why? Because we want to make sure that when we, we make a financing for them, that this financing fits with their lifestyle, fits with their cash flow, and we are not in the business to dig a deeper hole of debt for these people. This is. This is a cultural thing. It is, it is not, uh, oh, what's the difference? It's the same numbers. Oh, it's the same percentage. It's the culture. It's the way of thinking. It's the way of, of helping people live a new lifestyle. It's not the lifestyle of spend, spend, spend. Rent money, rent money, rent money. Use your plastic to spend more. It's a lifestyle which is the lifestyle that made America what America is today or has been in the past. So we, we are very keen about measuring the cash flow of this family. We are very keen about knowing what they want to buy. So if they want to buy a car, we want to make sure that they think of the process of buying a car as a, an investment process, not a process of renting money. What's the difference? When you look at it as an investment process, you are making a prudent decision to decide if doing this activity makes economic sense or not. If you are renting money, you are trying to meet the stimulus and the urge of trying to own something to be proud of. It. For instance, you know, somebody uh, will be buying a Rolls Royce. Why? Because he wants to have the urge of showing off and looking good and big in front of the rest of his friends and associates. And buying a car is actually an investment process, and that is the culture that we want to bring in. 
That is the training that we want each and every one of you to think of. We look in the market, find out how much is the leasing rate of a similar car. We look in the market to find out if that leasing rate is consistent from one area to another, from one uh, company to another company. And you get three estimates, we get three estimates, and we calculate the rate of return on investment of owning this car. And on that basis, we calculate the uh, monthly payment. Now, the other thing I wanted to, to tell you about, and I think we explained that last time very in great detail, is the fact that if a customer comes to you as a trained RF banker and he's looking for $200,000 and we think that he only needed 100, we will tell him, Mr. Customer, you only need 100 or 150, not 200. And why is that? We'll show him why is that. And if he comes and says, well, I want to get $100,000, and we ask him, what do you want to use the money for? And he says, none of your business. He's not your customer, because it is my business. Because as we said before, that money is a non-fungible or fungible, it is fungible. And when I give it to you, Mr. Customer, then it is yours. And I cannot claim it back, because now I'm entrusting you with it to invest in it, and that's why our motto as a, as a bank, our motto as a company is, we do not rent money, we invest in you as our customer. And I wanted to read uh, chapter 12 in more details. Now, we have the computer program, which is a proprietary uh, product of La Riba, and it's a very valuable piece of our assets in, in the company and in the bank, uh, it calculates the rate of return on investment. Now, that rate of return on investment is a, the most important decision-making tool. So you may be a customer who makes a lot of money. You may be a customer who has wonderful ratios, financial ratios. You may be a customer that that is got an 800 uh, FICO credit rating, but then the investment didn't make sense. The rate of return was 1% and 2%. We'll tell you, Mr. Customer, that is not a prudent investment. We strongly recommend that you back off. We think that this property is either overpriced or it doesn't make economic sense to buy. And that is the value we bring in, the value of thinking as an investor, as a prudent investor. Why? Because you become extravagant, you burn your money. You know, in, in, in the culture of the last years of that 20th century, uh, in, in Northern California, in, in Silicon Valley, uh, all of these thought co uh, companies, not companies, you know what they called it? The rate of burning money. Did you ever hear that terminology? They used to call it the rate of burning money. They would raise about $100 million, and they say we are burning money at the rate of $200,000 a month or $500,000. We do not burn money. We respect money because it's a tool that will reflect the profitability or loss of a certain project. So that is what we do. So you compare what we do to what is done in the river-based banks. We have a long process, much longer than a regular bank. Now, we go to the next episode, and that is now we want to look for a bank. And I want to tell you, it took us eight years to find this bank. We started in 1990, and we actually closed on the bank in 1998, January 1998. And I wanted to share this with you, uh, all of you, because uh, you should be proud of what you all have contributed to. It is not done by one man. It is done by many, many of you, actually all of you. Without you, we wouldn't have had this. And you should be proud of yourself. It's, it's a wonderful story, part of history, that you are part of it. So here's a list of what we can afford. So when we go looking for a bank, this is what I want to look. It's like, it's like going out and looking for a car. You know, There are two ways of looking for a car. One way is just to go out, you know, wandering around from a car lot to a car lot. Or you can say, well, I want a car that will see four. I want a car that is economical. I want a car that's in a certain price range. I want a car that will be comfortable, but it doesn't have to be extravagant. So you decide what you want. 
So we sat down and decided what kind of bank can we afford and what kind of bank we should be looking for. First of all was a capital. If we want to buy this bank, how much should we pay for it? And we said that we're looking for a bank with, with a capital of about a, one and a half million to three million. Very few banks at the time would qualify for this. And the second thing was a loan portfolio. Now, uh, from my experience in banking, you can hide any bad loan you want. Of course, you have, if you have a large loan portfolio, like 400 loans, 500 loans, uh, you can hide two, three, four, five bad loans. So we wanted a loan portfolio that is as small as possible. Why? Because my promise to myself and to my team was that we will do the due diligence on the loan portfolio on our own, loan file by loan file. And not only because of that, but because also it's very expensive to hire a consultant to do it. So we were really working at a shoestring level. So we wanted the loan portfolio as small as possible, 10 million, 5, 15 million, and so on. And then what charter are we looking for? As you know, there are two types of banks. Now, there are state banks, and if it's a state bank, it's very limited in where it can operate. It only can operate in the state it is licensed in, unless you get some special permit to go to another state with reciprocity and so on and so forth. Or a national bank. If it's a national bank, then it is regulated by the OCC and the Department of Treasury. It's a federally chartered institution. And that allows you to cross the boundaries from one state to another much easier than a state bank. And then where to have the bank, the location of the bank. Of course, we wanted a bank that would serve Los Angeles County and Orange County. And we were looking somewhere in between the two counties. And we found the Bank of Whittier. Uh, bank of Whittier at the time, its capital was about $2.9 million. Its loan portfolio was, I think, about eight, nine million million. Its assets were about $32 million. And it was not doing very well. As a matter of fact, the bank was under something called MOU, Memorandum of Understanding which means it was a troubled bank. Uh, the portfolio was not doing well. It was losing money. Management was really in shambles, and it was not a very good bank. So we went in, and we started negotiating. Uh, we negotiated with an old person who was actually in the printing business. And he didn't know much about banking, but I said, Mr. Ganam, uh, why are you in this bank? He said, uh, well, listen. I discovered that I'm paying this bank interest more than actually the dividend and the profit I can do, so I started buying the shares. So uh, he owned 60% of the bank. So we agreed with him to sell the shares. Well, it turns out that he didn't know much about the law of the land, and he said, I'm going to sell you my shares. Well, the law of the land, and this is very important to know, is you cannot front the rest of your shareholders. In other words, if I own 80% of the bank of Whittier and I have 20% shareholders and somebody comes to me and says, yeah, yeah, I'm going to buy your shares for X, you cannot front your other shareholders. You all have to get together and sell your shares together. You cannot just separately sell these shares, especially if you are the chairman of the board. Well, after agreeing with him to invest uh, $3.5 or $4 million to buy 50% of his shares, he, we told him the, the problem. He said, no, you buy the whole bank. Well, we bought the whole bank. I'll never forget this. I, I remember when I had to mortgage my house and get the money into my account at Smith Barney. Believe it or not, management from New York sent an email to my manager to ask me, where did you get the money from? It shows you how careful and meticulous the United States eyes are on people who are in financial services. And I say this because if you think you are smart, think again. Every move that you do is highly scrutinized by the United States governments to make sure 
that the financial system in America is intact. Now, when we bought the Bank of Whittier, uh, uh, of course, now we are buying a big chunk of the bank, buying all the shares of the bank. The structure of the bank, again, another little business law situation. The bank, this bank that you're sitting in, is owned by one shareholder only. And that one shareholder is what we call the holding company of the bank. The holding company of the bank is Greater Pacific Bank Shares. As you read in the book earlier, during the Clinton era, the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed. Remember the Glass-Steagall Act? Ojea? Ojea, you remember the Glass-Steagall Act? You remember it? Yes. This is the act that put in a Chinese wall separating investment banking from commercial banking. Right, Maria? Yes, doctor. The glass steel act. So that was repealed, and then it allowed banks to do anything. Well, the previous owners said, oh, let us have a holding company that will own the bank of Whittier, and eventually we can own an insurance company, and we eventually can own an investment bank so we can sell shares and so on and so forth. So this is Greater Pacific Bank shares if you haven't understood what it is. So it is the only shareholder of the Bank of Whittier, and people who buy shares in our company, they are not buying shares in the Bank of Whittier, but they are buying shares in the holding company, which is Greater Pacific Bank shares. Now that is interesting because now, this means that we have three entities that we had to apply for change of control with. And it was the most educational experience in my life, and I will share it with you for your enrichment and for your future reference. The first entity, obviously, this is a bank. It is uh, supervised by the Department of Treasury of the United States government, Office of the Controller of the Currency. So we have to file for change of control with the office of the controller of the currency. And it is not controller with an NT, but it's comptroller, C-O-M-P-T, which means the people that count the money uh, of the currency. And uh, if you don't know how tough and demanding they are, uh, please ask and uh, they will tell you uh, at the Bank of Whittier uh, how tough and demanding uh, they are. Uh, uh, Alex and uh, Mohammed and Bill can, can tell you uh, what we go through every year uh, dealing with that. The second entity, of course, is the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States government. Why? Because a holding company has under it so many financial institutions that are regulated with the Federal Reserve Bank and we dealt not only with the Federal Reserve Bank in Washington, D.C., but the branch of the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco, which is the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Remember, when I introduced you to the Federal Reserve System, how many Federal Reserve regional banks do we have? How many, Bill? Seven. How many, Anwar? Nine. How many? Nine. Nine. How many? Huh? Nine. How many, Alex? Twelve. Well, there are 12 regional banks in the United States, actually. The, the, the nine that you remember are the number of, share, uh, number of board of directors members, Anwar. That's where the nine comes from. All right? So, so the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, that's the second entity that we have to deal with. And the third ent ent uh, entity is, of course, the bank is FDIC insured, so we have to file control FDIC insured. Do you know how long it took us of application to change control until the time we got the bank? 11 months, 11 months. And in order to cut the cost, the legal cost, we agreed with the lawyer, Gary Findlay. I said, listen, Gary, we don't have much money and you understand. He said, no, I understand. So we would prepare the documents ourselves, respond to the questions and then send them back to the lawyer to have a review, and by the way, this is the process we use until today to cut costs and legal expenses. And we would send it to the regulators. You will not believe the kind of detailed 
digging the regulators go through to get to know who you are. As a matter of fact, when I was uh, asked to attend the closing meeting of all of this so they can give us a change of control, uh, I had uh, to have a conference call with our lawyer, of course, with the OCC, both OCC Washington, D.C., and OCC in California, with the Federal Reserve Bank both in Washington, D.C. and in San Francisco, and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Now, not only uh, that all of these people were sitting down and, and asking questions and so on, I told them the following. I told them I want to make two comments. Number one, uh, what God is asking us to win paradise is much easier than getting a license to operate a bank in the United States. And this is a true statement. And the second thing is that you fellows know about me and my shareholders and our families more than our parents would know about us. And, and that was the end of it. And that was in January 1998 when we took control of the bank of Whittier. Now, but that, we, we thought that this is the beginning of a wonderful uh, future and that our problems have been solved, uh, solved and if this is the case, think again, because that was the beginning of a real tough uh, experience uh, that we are challenging ourselves with until today. Uh, first thing is, uh, we got the thing. And the first thing the board of directors uh, of the previous board of directors did, they just left the bank. So we ended up with a bunch of desks and open space and a bunch of disgruntled employees, and we didn't know what to do. So, um, and a president who thought that, you know, he is the guy who's going to, to realize what he realized, but uh, to make a story short, you can read the rest of it. Uh, we changed two presidents couldn't hack it, and I had to take early retirement and a number of steps backward uh, to go and run the bank. With when we did, we started running the bank of Whittier in 2003. Uh, the bank of Whittier had only two employees left in it, and what we did, we it was uh, uh, Mike Abdelati, uh, Mohammed Abdelati, and I, and through the invisible hand of God, the man that helped us start Lariba and put the computer system together and so on appears on the scene. His name is Abdullah Tag from Turkey, and he calls me up and says, I'm here in town. He said, what are you doing? As if God has sent him to help me out. And the four of us went to the Bank of Whittier, and there was nothing. And I want to tell the Bank of Whittier people, uh, Alex, uh, Bill, uh, Daniel, Ujiha, Rada, Anwar, and I hope I didn't miss Alex. I'm telling you, the computers at the Bank of Whittier were used as typewriters. The, the accounts loaded on the Bank of Whittier navigator system were actually all messed up. It took us meticulous going through about 1,500 accounts that were messed up because they didn't know how to board a last name before a first name sometimes, and the others in the first name after that. Just unbelievable. But anyway, uh, we got it licked, we organized it, and here is a list of the things that we promised the regulators because the regulators said, well, fellas, if you don't keep up, we're going to close your bank. I said, no. I took early retirement, I left everything behind, and I'm going to go and fix this bank before we lose the investment of our shareholders. Uh, uh, turning the bank around required that we rectify all the regulatory concerns as soon as possible. We wanted to increase the bank capital. We wanted to stress the quality in our services, and the slogan we have started then was, we do not rent money, we invest in our customers. And by the way, I would like to write it down as we invest with our customers, but the regulators prohibited us from doing that because banks cannot invest with customers. They can uh, 
metaphorically say we invest in customers but not with customers. You know the difference, right? Investing with and investing in customers. Uh, we wanted to control uh, the bank expenses, you know, make it very tight. The tradition of printing on both sides of the paper started then. We said we want to use both sides of the paper so we can cut the cost of the paper and be socially responsible. And most importantly, we took the decision that this business was just hiring a person with 40 years of banking experience or 20 years of banking experience is not enough. We're going to hire highly educated and highly qualified staff members, and we wouldn't mind training them, and I'm sure each and every one of you is a product of this philosophy. We wanted to use the best technologies available. We wanted to improve the bank facilities. As a matter of fact, this bank did not have offices like you see. Uh, this bank had an open space, desk after desk after desk, all in shambles, wires, and so on. It was really in a bad shape. And uh, we improve the facilities to get the feel that you are in a private bank, that you are visiting with your family, and we wanted to achieve competitive uh, profitability. We wanted to increase the loan portfolio to reach 70 to 75 percent of the total deposits. And uh, how much are we sitting at now, Alex? 64, 65 percent? Okay, we want to improve the quality and ex expand the bank's loan portfolio using RF financing for the first time as a discipline, and we wanted to attract deposits from new customers. We wanted to offer a credit card service through an outside company because we did not want to deal with RIBA. So, and we told our customers on the front page, I don't know if you noticed it or not, on the front page of the Bank of Whittier, we said that Dealing with credit cards is prohibited from a Sharia standpoint, and that we're offering this as a service, and we encourage you to pay it before the end of the month so you can avoid paying riba. Matter of fact, the regulators called me up and they said they have never seen a bank encouraging their people to pay as soon as possible. Because most, most banks like them to sit in credit card debt as long as possible so they can make as much money as they can. And we wanted to develop an image that would fit with community responsibility. Uh, we also wanted to have bank policies. The bank never had policies. And, and we had to, to start a policy system. All the policies that you have on uh, the W Drive and on Alex's uh, files and Mohammed and so on, all these policies did not exist. We started those from scratch. And then, of course, the training using the Bank of Whittier Open University, something that we have innovated. And we wanted to enhance the security. ADT was not there. We did not have any security concept of what it should be. There was no bank. We wanted to improve the quality of the service, the computer systems, the deposit base, and operating expenses, reduce it, and increase the bank income if we can. Now, here are some of the samples of what we implemented in the management of the bank. And some of these I learned from my 18 years experience in an investment bank. And, and believe me, that was a wonderful education for me. First thing, all incoming and outgoing mail and taxes had to be reviewed by a senior manager. Why is that? Because if you can get on top of this, you will know the pulses of your organization. Why? If you get to review the incoming and outgoing mail, you will know the billing, the invoices, who you are dealing with. If you know what is incoming and outgoing, you will right away be the first one to know that there is a problem, there is a complaint, there is a legal problem that you have to deal with. Same thing with the faxes. If you know the faxes that are coming in and going out, you will know the pulses of the office that you're working in, you know the pulses of the organization. And also you will discipline people before they go and shoot things out to the world. They will be able to be scrutinized and you will have a second opinion on things before they said that. Of course, uh, we have a culture of authorizing faxes before they are sent out, of authorizing letters before they are sent out. Now, some of us, some of the supervisors sign blindly and that's their prerogative. But I always told all our staff, all of our associates, 
to please make sure if your supervisor signs before he read, reads it, go to him and tell him, I, I want you to read it. That's why I want your signature. Don't just be happy that he signed and you run and do it or send it and so on and so forth. Make sure that he reads it because he owes it to you that he gives you his or her opinion as your supervisor. Of course, hiring new employees and the quality of the employees that we hired, and this is a whole process that we innovated. We wanted men and women who are the best in their field, who are the best way they were raised by their families, people who say the truth, people who honor the trust, and I'm very happy we find each and every one of you. And if you don't believe me, ask people who have come and visit us. You'll find you a wonderful, homogeneous group of men and women, very cheerful, very well raised and very high quality and I'm honored to work with you all. And uh, the two mottos that we're socially responsible and we do not rent money. Finally, we put on our website what we call our code of ethics. And this is, this is the 10 golden rules of our code of ethics. We do not speculate with people's money and trust. We fulfill our promises so we do not make promises hastily. We think very carefully about what we promise. We respect money because money respects those who respect it. We do not forget our moral responsibility to local communities. We do not discriminate. We invest in our clients. We are socially responsible. We are sensitive about who we deal with. You know, we do not evaluate people based on how much money they have. We evaluate people on who they are, how they earn their money, and the quality of persons they are. We are conservative, and we look at each and every one of you as our partners in the business. Any questions? Is, uh, is Larima still uh, Chapter S despite its growth? Larima is uh, still Chapter S, and, uh, and it's doing very, very well. Why you uh, you were looking for a bank that's existing? Why didn't you open a new bank like you did uh, for? Uh, oh, because opening uh, opening a new bank was a very expensive undertaking. You you had to spend upfront before you do anything at least a million to one point two million dollars. We didn't have this kind of money. <laughs> we were very poor. Uh, yeah. So, so we wanted to have something that that is running and operating. So. Dr. Alman, did we spend about 400000 to open the uh, the Richardson branch? No, no. Uh, the Richardson branch uh, cost about $220,000, $230,000. Uh, and believe me, could have, we could have spent much more money on that. Do we have to go yes. to the same process for the Garden Grove branch, inshallah? No, no. Garden Grove was a very uh, sweet deal. The Garden Grove, the Garden Grove branch, I, I personally think it's a, it's a gift from God. Well, like, now, first of all, we never seek it. I got a call. I got a call from a fellow. Uh, you know, uh, those who do not know in Pasadena or in Dallas, we are opening a new branch in Garden Grove, which is a neighborhood uh, close to Disneyland and close to the Vietnamese community and the Pakistani Indian community and Latino communities. It's a very nice area. And, uh, I got a call from a friend of mine and he said that I have a friend who wants to come and talk to you. I said, yeah, welcome. So he comes to me and he says uh, that I am a very affluent uh, person. He owns, how many gas stations? 12 or 14, Alex. And, and very affluent. And he said, you know, I am opening a new shopping center concept. And in that shopping center, we are going to be selling fresh fruit and fresh vegetables, uh, fresh uh, poultry and meat, all halal. And I'm going to surround it with uh, restaurants and eatery places. And uh, I'm going to have a juice bar. I'm going to have uh, a, a Middle Eastern <coughs> restaurant. Lebanese restaurant, uh, Pakistani India restaurant, uh, Vietnamese Chinese restaurant, uh, Persian restaurant, uh, bakery, Persian, uh, Persian uh, Parisian uh, uh, bakery. I'm going to have a uh, ba it's a wonderful thing, 
And I'm going to have Seattle Best Coffee, which is owned by Starbucks. And I'm going to need a bank, and I want your bank to come. I said, sure, by all means. So the bank branch we have, <clears throat> he has actually um, uh, the, the, the rent on the bank is about $1,500. And he takes care of all the arrangements. So uh, so we, we, we have a wonderful operation which we're going to start as what we call a loan production office until we get the proper certifications and so on. And then it will be a full service bank. What is the requirement to open as another branch? Oh, the, you have to justify for opening the branch. You have to, you know, any, I hope I made the point that any time you want to do something in the financial industry, you have to get approvals from the government. So the first requirement is to prove to the government that it makes economic sense to go and open a branch. You have to have a market share. Why are you addressing this market? And so on and so forth. And it has to fit with your business plan. Uh, 